I will set the zeitgeist straight. The movie has too much of the cast in it. Man, I'm saddled with Jeff Goldblum, <laughs> the world's most uncharismatic <laughs> actor. But it has no poetry. That's not what this is about. The so. problem was when the hero started facing adversity. Get off your soapbox, Laura Dern. <laughs> I want to square off on this guy at a dinner party. The music was thick. So far, you have not dazzled me. I'm just letting you know. <laughs> well, Off the Mark was written in a kind of obsolete vernacular off the mark off the mark and scene thank you so much welcome <laughs> to off the way mark to act is that <laughs> <He's on drugs. laughs> welcome to off the mark good chat on bad takes of great movies i'm dave colombo I'm Mick Andrews. And uh, our fabulous special guest today, uh, musician, actor, and probably the most consistently on point person on social media that I have ever seen, Austin Archer, everybody. Clap it up. Ah, wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I apologize for the uh, overly enthusiastic. I'm, I'm a stand-up comedian who hosts a lot, so I'm used to like literally trying to get drunks to start clapping. So even in podcast form, I'm like, let's get the energy up in the room, everybody. Let's go. Let's move it. Very funny guy. You've seen him all <laughs> over the, the city. Take the comic out of the club. <laughs> yeah, it's 100%. Uh, so uh, this fabulous podcast, we like to wince through the worst reviews of the best movies ever made. Um, we've had a blast so far. Uh, uh, Mick, what have you learned? What movies do you now hate? Oh, goodness gracious sakes. <laughs> I mean, we heard some really good points about Star Wars, how the <laughs> Matrix is for nerds. Um, that uh, uh, John Jeff Williams. Goldblum could really turn up the charisma uh, a little bit. He's pretty dry in most of the things he's in. Yeah, John, I'm learning a lot. John um, Williams uh, is very uh, loud. This, yeah. It's been uh, it's been quite a uh, it's been quite a journey we've been on so far. Uh, today we are going to talk about one of my favorite movies of all time, maybe the best soundtrack in the history of cinema, The Royal Tenenbaums, um, two thousand one. What I've always loved about the movie is, to me, it's that it's that perfect middle where there's something I, I don't even know how to articulate it. Gene Hackman is not in the same movie as everybody else. No. <laughs> and I think that having that that juxtaposition uh make like add something incredibly special to the movie. Uh Wes Anderson has progressively gotten more and more uh, uh, as time has gone on into like I am literally telling you a fairy tale. And I think that Royal Tenenbaums is that perfect middle ground where yeah, you've got all the Wes Anderson fairy taleisms, but you also have um some real genuine attachment to the characters and to what's happening in a way that that kind of I I I, I don't even realize until I see an, a different Wes Anderson movie, which I still will like, but I'll be like I I miss Royal Tenen I miss that Royal Tenenbaums attachment. Me too. Yeah, and uh, those early films, and a lot of people really love Bottle Rocket. I do love Bottle Rocket, but to me, I take Rushmore, Royal Tenenbaums, The Life Aquatic, and Darjeeling Limited, and I think that that's like a four film run that uh, yeah. I would hold up against any filmmaker in the history of cinema. Like those four films, because I think Bottle Rocket sort of testing the waters of like, will people let me do do what I want to do? Rushmore, he gets to do it a little bit more. He's proven himself. Royal Tenenbaums is this film where it's like, it all comes together for Wes Anderson. This is where, this is sort of the world's mainstream inter introduction to the style and the type of filmmaker that he's going to go on to be. And I feel like this is the first time that it's really like, this is it. And for me, it's the movie where like everything's working about it. The the there's that humanity in the characters. There's parts of it that are rough around the edges. There's still like dirt and grime in the film. Not everything is polished and squeaky clean. Uh, the soundtrack is amazing, and yeah. I love this movie. Yeah, you get the vibe that you could still see. Like, it's still in the era where you could potentially see a Starbucks cup in the background. You know, like there was a... Whereas now, every single, like... I, I, I saw Asteroid City where I'm like, they must have spent 
45 minutes checking every shot to make sure that everything is in the exact spot that it's supposed to be. And Tenenbaums has that too, but Tenenbaums, like you're saying, that's a great point, actually does have like a little bit of like run and gun filmmaking. There's some camera movements and it's, it's, it's a little bit in the real world. Just, just, a, just a little bit, you know? Yeah. There's no yeah. dirt on the screen in Asteroid City. There's no dirt. <laughs> no. You know? Yeah. And it takes place in a desert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a good uh, point. Um, yeah, no, I think a lot of that is, uh, if I'm think if I'm, you know, kind of trying to cast back, please correct me if my Wes Anderson knowledge is off base, but it's one of the f last movies, I think, where he has like a fair amount of exterior shots of just like actual city kind of things going on. Battery, it's not all stop Battery motion. Park. Yeah. And, yeah. It's not all a controlled environment, you know? Um, and there's a little bit of that. There's a natural grit whenever you shoot in New York City, um, but yeah, I, I I love this movie, and I do. Everybody always kind of you know the the knock you hear about Wes Anderson is like he's got all his movies look the same. But what I do love about Royal Tenenbaums, maybe it's just because I saw it first because of that's how time works. But uh, subsequent movies do kind of feel like. Um, reskins of Royal Tenenbaums more than any other of his movies. You mm. know? Um, That's a good point. I've been thinking about this a lot, especially post Asteroid City and these this bunch of shorts that he released with Benedict Cumberbatch and just and French Dispatch had this a lot. I've been thinking about like where did the hinge point happen in his career? And for me, I think that it begins with Fantastic Mr. Fox because I think you give a director like that who's obsessed with control and specificity, you put him in the realm of animation and he can control every single detail mm. of every frame and every arm movement and every... And I think he... After that film, there's a difference in the way that the films look. And it's almost like he went, I never want to make a movie any other way than this ever again. I want to have absolute control over everything. And in those earlier films, Rushmore, Tenenbaums, Zisu, and Darjeeling Limited, there's still a lot of life and humanity and things that are that have room to breathe within the dollhouse aesthetic you know that's a it's a, you know i've reading some of the trivia for the movie i'm not sure how apocryphal it is but i think it's been spoken spoken of in interviews where like both wes anderson and gene hackman have come out and saying like i only made gene hackman only made this movie because he was uh he was promised that it would be easy and it wasn't yeah. and he was kind of an asshole on set and wes anderson feels really bad that he wasn't able to give him the the easy experience and like he lashed out on set and made some of the actors uncomfortable and you know like that level of tenseness doesn't come off in the movie like ooh they they were having a bad time there's something about like the fact that it does feel like a, a movie where Wes Anderson wasn't necessarily in control of every single aspect where it there's some heart to there there's some heart to that that you know, you're not going to see in Fantastic Mr. Fox where the 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 animated uh, uh, fox isn't going to storm off on set because uh, because they're they went over. Well, it's like Danny Glover didn't know at that point who Wes Anderson was or what a Wes Anderson movie was. You know, like it it, it was early enough in the career. Nowadays, you get all these guys. You get you get Brian Cranston. You get Steve Carell. You get. Uh, Tom Hanks, and they're all just like excited to go play in a Wes Anderson movie. Mm -hmm. You get Benedict Cumberbatch, and they're excited that they get to go do the Wes Anderson thing. And you almost get like you watch Asteroid City, and it's Tom Hanks trying to do his impression of what a Wes Anderson movie sounds like. And that Gene Hackman's not doing that because there is no impression of of what a Wes Anderson movie sounds like in his mind. Danny Glover's not doing that yeah. because there is no Angelica Houston's not really doing that. Right. Like, it doesn't w exist at this point. Wes Anderson's friends are all doing it. People who have been in his other movies are doing it. But I, I was always curious, like, what do you think Wes Anderson tells, like, especially now? What do you think he tells a, like, a, like a Scarlett Johansson who's like, so you've seen my movies. Thank you for doing this. Here's what I want. I want no subtext behind the eyes. I want you to say the lines. I want on this moment. Like, what do you think it is? How do you direct somebody in a, into a Wes Anderson style? I mean, by the first of all, I want to say, I think Scarlett Johansson in Asteroid City is like one of the most interesting performances I've seen her give Phenomenal. in a long time. She's she's the best part of the movie acting wise, in my opinion. And I think that she finds the most interesting choices within the world. 
Um, as far as what he's telling people early on in these films, I mean, I ha I do have some fun insight into this. So I'm in a couple movies that are coming out this summer, a couple Westerns that Kevin Costner made. And uh, my whole storyline is with Luke Wilson. So me and Luke Wilson, I'm his like lieutenant of this um, uh, wagon train. And he, then Luke Wilson sort of the lead of my storyline. And I'm like his right hand man. And so all of my scenes in this movie were with Luke and the whole first movie, I didn't dare to tell him that my favorite film of all time is the Royal Tenenbaums. <laughs> and then we were at a party uh, before day one of shooting the second film. And I was hanging out with him and I was like, Hey, I didn't tell you this on, on movie one, but you're in my favorite movie of all time. And he goes, what's that? And I said, the Royal Tenenbaums. And luckily Luke goes, you know, for most of my career, when people ask me what my favorite movie I've ever done is, that was my answer is the Royal Tenenbaums. And oh. I said, Oh good. And he goes, and I said, what are you telling people now? And he said, this the movie we're making right now and i went i went oh my god but so we talked a little what a bit pro. Of, yeah right <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah yeah so we talked a little bit about it and i uh, and i was i was saying exactly this i was talking about how gene hackman's like not doing a wes anderson thing and then luke goes oh well gene hackman didn't want to be in a fucking wes anderson movie and I, go, <laughs> <laughs> I go i was like yeah that's what i've heard i've heard that right and he's like he's like oh yeah he didn't want to be there he was like mad about it the whole time and i'm like but he's giving one of my favorite performances of his career. And he told me this funny anecdote where he goes, we're shooting a scene one day and, uh, and we're talking and Wes comes up and he goes, sorry, Gene, I need you to step a couple steps to the left because I need that picture frame between you guys to be centered between the two of you. And Hackman looks at him and goes, what are you talking about? And he goes, <laughs> I'm, I'm saying that picture frame needs to be centered between the two of you while you're talking. And Gene Hackman goes, so I'm, I'm acting with him right now and you're looking at the picture frame behind me. <laughs> it's like any actor that does a Wes Anderson movie now understands that that's going to be part of the deal. Yeah. Understands that they're going to be standing on a mark and you will not stray from your mark unless you are directed to do so. But Gene Hackman at this point in his career is like, oh, what man. are you saying? Yeah. <laughs> I never... You know, I have an Oscar, right? <laughs> I I'm Lex Luthor. I have more respect for Wes Anderson than I've ever had before. The idea of having to be Wes Anderson's mind before everybody knows and gets it of having to like simultaneously make a Wes Anderson movie and also have to do the spiel about how important it is to you that that frame is making movies takes forever and setting up a shot even in like I've I've been in movies where like it took 10 hours to set up the shot and then I see it and I'm like that's awful like <laughs> it's it's not a guarantee it's sloppy yeah the amount of prep that must go into a Wes Anderson movie and on top of that to have to wrangle actors to even know what it is that you're doing. You do want to, like, it's almost like, hey, let me give you a sizzle reel of my previous stuff. Let me give you a minute and a half just so that you're not, so you know what is going to come out of this. Because to answer your question about what do you think he says to the actors, I think he just had to let Gene Hackman go. Yeah. And just go, he's going to do what he does. And I think that's what really works about the movie and what is missing in these later films mm -hmm. is I think that it's better for Wes Anderson's films to have actors who are going to take the reins a little bit. I think the last time this happened is Ray Fiennes in Grand Budapest. Ray Fiennes is like, yeah, I'll be in your movie, but I'm going to like, I'm going to do my thing. Yeah. And he fucking kills it in that movie. And I think yeah, that like great. actors need to have the confidence to sort of make it their own in his world. And um, they also just incredibly lucked out with who within the context of the movie that character was like yeah. as the estranged father it's like kind of fine that the chemistry of his character relative to every other character is tense and uncomfortable like nobody really has to pretend they like him in this movie which yeah. is and super he, useful he doesn't understand gene hackman the actor probably doesn't understand what the fuck they're doing in terms of like that's your delivery and he's also not supposed to understand his kids so it yeah. all fits. And and to your point, Austin, as as an as an audience member, look, I love, I love Wes Anderson movies. I'm there opening night every single time. I do miss a POV character. I do miss an audience surrogate who's there and like at any point you get the feeling that Gene Hackman will look to camera and go, like, do you know what's happening? 
because yeah. like like it is so stylized and it is like the the, the uh, uh asteroid city feels like it was on mars i don't under like i'm i'm trying to get in to everybody and i know that's the point i know that's the energy and that's the style and it's beautiful and i loved it and it was great but to be i think a top tier wes anderson movie you do need that one person who's kind of going like you, you guys see all this right <laughs> like it, mm -hmm. to have that little extra character i think is is goes a long way and like you say with grand budapest probably finds is is the closest we've had since then from what i've read too we also have gene hackman being an asshole to thank for wes anderson's relationship with bill murray like he was in rushmore before this but he had signed on for this movie and basically wes anderson was getting bullied by gene hackman so much that it was affecting the set so bill murray started showing up on days even when he was off and hanging out with wes anderson just to like keep keep people light and apparently that's kind of where they really started to like click on a much better level and and kind of get what now is like literally every single Wes Anderson movie has a Bill Murray character. Even Tom Hanks in Asteroid City was supposed to be Bill Murray. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, w it, it, so so we'll hop in here in a second. I, I would love to just kind of ask, like, what is it if you could articulate um relatively briefly what is it that you like about wes anderson films in general in general i got my zisu shirt on here and my <clears throat> zisu hat um in, in general i'm always moved by any artist who manages to create a visual language and aesthetic that is instantly recognizable as their own once you're in the world of creativity and trying to make things you understand how rare and how difficult that is so when you know just regardless of uh, you know what their personal life was like uh, how instantly recognizable you know bob fossey's movement is if someone dances like bob fossey everyone knows what that is it looks like bob fossey uh, I was always a big admirer of Michael Jackson for the same reason, creating a dance vocabulary that if anyone does those moves, it's instantly recognizable as Michael Jackson. There's something about that level of uh, confidence in one's artistic vision being so different from everyone else that it's it's very clear you're distinguishing yourself and <clears> – <throat> trusting it even if not everyone gets it and wes anderson has always been a person who you either get it or you don't and i i'm my whole life i've shown his movies to people who to me it, it seems unmistakable it's like how could you miss this how could you not see how the craft on display here happened last night because i knew we were doing this uh the person i'm dating she had never seen royal tenenbaums and i said we're gonna watch it we sat down and watched it and it was very obvious that she was not into it the entire film. And I'm sitting there the entire film going like, but it's perfect. Like there isn't <laughs> to me, the script is like every line is perfect. There's not a thing out of place. Every like a character will say something and the response is perfect. Gene Hackman goes, he's not your father, you know, and Gwyneth Paltrow goes, neither are you. And it's just like, <laughs> it's just the perfect response. Everything is like. And I'm sitting there next to a person going, how are you not seeing it? I mean, uh, the Richie scene comes up and I go, this is one of the best scenes in the history of cinema in my mind. The scene happens and then she looks at me and goes, what about the scene are you impressed by? And I'm like, what do you mean? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, what yeah, do you yeah. mean? I said, did, did you just watch it? We've, like, we've had many conversations about both Mick and I are completely unable to let somebody organically. Like if it's a movie that I'm excited to show you, I'm behind you going, the yeah, entire yeah. time what yeah, we've we've said before but I, when i watch a movie that i've seen and someone's watching it for the first time i watch them watch the movie i don't watch the movie <laughs> like i'm just dialed into how they respond to my favorite parts of this movie and then take it personally when they don't like it the way yeah. i do were you <laughs> my, able... my parents my my parents called me recently they watched royal tenenbaums for the first time on my recommendation and they said what about that movie do you like we just didn't get it <laughs> and i just kind of sat there and i was like I can't explain it to you if you don't get it. If yeah. it doesn't, but then when I watch it, I don't understand how someone can't see what's special about it. So when you yeah. ask that question, like, what do you like about Wes Anderson? It's just like, well, the thing that he's doing to distinguish himself visually, which is uh, non-debatable. Everyone in the world understands that there is a visual aesthetic that is part of the movies that is unmistakable, that if you see it, you know it. 
but it's much more than the visual aesthetic. It's the rhythm that people speak in. It's a very particular sense of humor that mm -hmm. is that it, you almost don't see anywhere else. It's mm -hmm. a very, very specific sense of humor. It's a very specific style of acting. It's a very specific style of visual storytelling. And it either works for you or it doesn't. But for me, I as a person who it works for, I don't understand how it when someone watches the Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou or uh, Rushmore, how it couldn't possibly work. <laughs> and as someone who who it works for, yeah, the, it is it, like like the Coen Brothers. It is an experience that you're not gonna get watching any other movie. When I sit down for a Wes Anderson movie. I'm excited because I genuinely don't know what's going to happen. I, I don't know what to feel. Nothing is is pre-planned for me. Um, music cues don't hit the same way they do in, in other movies. Like a lesser director trying to tell the same story with the same message. It, it's not going to go in the direction that I think it is. And I'm visually going to see something different every time. I'm sitting down to a Wes Anderson movie like a blank slate. Like, take me. Take me on this ride. You'll never see those actors the same again in any other movie. Those Every actor that, that, that's in the movies, actors that you've seen in tons of other things, you'll never see them like this anywhere else, yeah. you know? Yeah, it's pretty great. The only other person, when as you were talking about this visual vocabulary, the one person that came to mind in terms of filmmakers for that, that I feel it's different, but it strikes me the same way is Christopher Guest. Um, to me has a very, like the minute you watch a Christopher Guest movie, you know, it's, uh, it's one of his movies and it's, you know, in the same way that like there are now AI Wes Anderson remakes of different movies and stuff. The language is adaptable by other people, but it's still not the same. Like, mm -hmm. like Parks and Rec and The Office are their own style of comedy, but they really are kind of playing off of this mockumentary style that was spearheaded by one guy um, in a way that, like, I don't know. Every time I watch a, a Christopher Guest movie for the first time, I'm like, it might not be my favorite. I might not even think wall to wall all of it's good, but I know that it's going to be... Uh, uh, a group of actors who have all worked together, even even that same kind of idea of using the same troupe of actors throughout their all their films. Um, and everybody's going to be banging on all cylinders, kind of making this unique flavor of movie that doesn't really show up in... Uh, they're really the only people that make these kinds of movies, and they make them well, because and, and, they make them so well. And similarly, I can't tell you how many times I've watched waiting for Guffman with someone and they looked at me and went, what is funny about this? Oh, exactly. Go, yeah. And I go, that... I can't explain it to you if you don't get it. Cause I think it's one of the funniest movies ever made. So like, yeah. I, I can't explain it to I... you if you, if you know, that's the other thing. It either hits you or it doesn't. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Austin, you were doing a great job. Uh, you, you just, you just ruined my night by mentioning waiting for Guffman because now in the middle of the podcast, I'm just going to have in my head stool boom, stool boom, <laughs> penny <laughs> for <laughs> your <laughs> thoughts. <laughs> Guys, just sucked. Yeah. I mean, but yeah, the hard, the literally maybe the hardest I've ever laughed was uh, the first time I saw um, a mighty wind when they cut to Mitch and Mickey doing the solo acts after they break up and Mitch is doing all of his sad albums and it just cuts to like the last one is called calling it quits and it's literally him He's digging a grave digging his own grave oh. and it's just him with a full on beard staring it's, at the camera just like it's just so so funny. His solo albums, like a cry for help, and then finally, yeah, cry for help. Right. Yeah. Oh man! Like, why? Why is that the album? Uh, like, clearly, you're in a sad place. You shouldn't be making albums. It's almost, it's almost like that movie was a parody of Inside Lou and Davis before Inside Lou and Davis was 100%. made. hundred yeah. oh yeah, percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, that is the other thing with those movies, by the way, is like. He does have moments like I feel the same way about a penny for your thoughts in waiting for Guffman. And I, to this day, can't tell if that's meant to be exclusively played for laughs or if you are meant to feel the way I do, which is like genuinely touched by that scene. Yeah. Oh, this <laughs> is it's so great. But of course, it's it's uh, quirky singing it. So it's you. I just feel so conflicted with that. I'm like, am I supposed to be moved or 
am I supposed to not take this seriously because it's quirky and well yeah. to bring it back around to Royal Tenenbaums I think something that we're talking about here is the ability for like absurdist humor to catch you off guard um I apologize in advance I am literally I I do not have full control of my emotions I am going to cry the um I saw Royal Tenenbaums when it came out, and it was fine. It was great. I uh, loved it. Uh, quotable. Loved the soundtrack. As I've gotten older and as I have both been the recipient of and been the cause of some family issues, the movie has such a different mm -hmm. read. Um, and that last moment when... Um, when Ben Stiller, when the music of uh, the spark plug minuet is heightened at the very end and the, the strings come in and yeah. Ben Stiller says, it's been a hard year, dad. This movie that has been like funny yeah. as fuck in a way that movies are not usually funny. It's th this is not a, a Judd Apatow movie. You do not, you can't anticipate what the joke is when the scene starts. To get to a point where you are picking very specific moments to hit these dramatic crescendos, they hit in a different way than a regular drama. A movie that is able to like be funny, 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 and then like, oh yeah, we're gonna we're gonna throw it in right here. Like th this is the part that's gonna it 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 affects you differently. Well, and it's like it. I mean, and it's again so simple. And like I said, not a line out of place. His response: "I know you have Chazzy." Yeah. So, not, but also uh, earlier when he's tying his tie with Henry, and Henry goes, "You know, I'm a widower." And then uh, Ben Stiller goes, "Oh, I'm a widower myself." And Henry turns to him and says, "I know you are, Chaz." I know you. Yeah. Yeah. And just sort of looks at him like, "I, I mean, know, man." Just, yeah. just throwing it out there. Can Danny Glover be my dad to, for like, just <laughs> like, just, just when I need? I mean, what gravitas? He's always had it, but especially in that role to kind of come in and just be like, "There's no Colby General," like, and just like you know, laying out the truth when everybody needs to hear. Oh fuck. Okay. I mean, nine hours later, let's uh. <clears throat> let's uh let's jump in here. December 14, 2001, a budget of 21 million dollars, it made 52 million dollars domestic and 19 million dollars international for a world worldwide gross of 71 million. Um not the biggest hit we've seen. <laughs> no, I mean for what it is, it's not like, you know, a lot of the movies that we've, we, we do a lot of Spielberg on this podcast and there's a lot of like, it was the biggest movie of the year. This yeah. is like, Grossing you know, three quarters of a billion dollars. Yeah. Th for, for a movie that's about family struggles and by Wes Anderson, I think that's, that's not bad. It, oh yeah. Uh, it went, it, it was a released slow. It's hard to find like hard numbers on like how it did compared to other movies. Cause it was slowly released over a couple of months in different places um when when it was mass release it came in number five behind fellowship of the ring a beautiful mind oceans 11 and jimmy neutron i just oh, love that I, last one was a curveball yeah, yeah i just love i just love that slice of life of what what movie what you go to the theater in 2001 what do you got like should we see fellowship of the ring oceans 11 or beautiful mind this is from salon december 14th 2001 so uh, again, just for reference, I, 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 I'm not reading everything verbatim. I took out a lot of the plot synopsis and kind of some stuff that doesn't really make sense. And we don't name names here, but if you want to look it up, you can find out who this person was. Here we go. <clears throat> the Royal Tenenbaums marks Wes Anderson as a director whose heart is in the right place. The problem is that everything else is out of whack. There's an awkward. Okay, wait, okay, wait. <laughs> Already. One of the most meticulously made movies of all time. No, he's Just out the of whack. Idea of being okay. No, it's sorry. All... It this, that the first thing that you can say in your say review is, is everything's out of whack. It's yeah. got the right idea, but everything's out of whack, and it's like, how dare you imply that any of this is disorganized? It just doesn't like... <laughs> come together. You know what I mean? Like whatever message he's trying to, like the only thing you could say about Wes Anderson, even all those people you talked about who like don't like your family and the person you're dating who like did don't get it, they would probably still admit like, oh, he's doing exactly what he wants to do. I just don't get it. 
but it's sort of the way not. that I th- there there are directors like that 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 for whatever reason their films have never resonated with me emotionally. But when I watch them, I can see this person knows how to make a good movie. They're making the exact they're executing their vision exactly the way they want to execute it. So like you know, L- Yorgos Lanthimos was one of those directors for me for a while. I loved Poor Things, but you I used to go watch his movies and I'd be like. He's very clearly doing a thing like and he is doing the thing that he wants to do. And it's very specific and he's very good at it. It just wasn't connecting with me emotionally. Loved poor things. But it's like you can't watch the Royal Tenenbaums and think this thing's a mess. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, well, just just wait, because the way this person like articulates it is like the. okay. we're just going to get there. Okay. Yeah. There's an awkward self-consciousness to the way the strings, to the way he strings scenes together like giant wooden beads that some critics. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when I watch Wes Anderson, I I don't know about you. I'm thinking I'm giant just, wooden beads. Uh, like giant. Wood. When I walk out of a I Wes Anderson if movie. If it's just the lunacy of that analogy or the way you delivered that line <laughs> like these giant wooden beads when you walk uh, out of a wes anderson movie don't you think to yourself like i like the way those giant wooden beads tied together you know that he was writing that at home and he was like he strings the scenes together like a strung together thing i'll, I'll, I'll figure it like, out i'll figure it out when i get home place, yeah. it, insert <laughs> placeholder yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And then he got home and he was like, honey, I nailed it. I got it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Giant wooden beads that some critics and fans have hailed as visionary in his previous films, Bottle Rocket and particularly Rushmore. But to the rest of us, those scenes don't connect in any meaningful rhythm. And that's only the beginning. Anderson's other hallmarks here are brilliant gags that deflate in the execution, potentially interesting characters that end up so flat they feel as if they'd been cut out of paper, a plot that's all set up and no story. Look, here's the thing is, in some ways, I feel like this review is being written about some of his later work where mm-hmm. it feels like the, the the characters are cut out of paper and where the dollhouse aesthetic has been pushed to the point where... Mm all of the room for breath and for the actors to experiment has been taken out. I just don't find that in the early work. I think the thing that's impressive about the early work is, I mean, there is this cartoon thing going on in the Royal Tenenbaums where characters wear the same outfits every day. You know, Ben Stiller and his kids wear those track suits no matter what day it is. The bomber wears his suit with his, like every single day with his, his headband. Margot wears the same outfit every day. Royal wears basically the same suit every day. He just changes what color the pastel shirt underneath mm-hmm. is every day. Um, in some ways, it is cut out of paper. But what's so impressive about it is how alive they all are inside of that thing. But this critic is like, I don't think Wes Anderson realizes that these characters are two-dimensional. And I think that it is the very unique rhythm, the thing that I love about the films, the unique rhythm, the unique sense of humor that throws people off. And I think this happens with Christopher Guest, too. It's a comedic rhythm that if you don't catch the wave can feel very odd. Mm -hmm. And you're just sort of going like, what am I watching? I'm just sort of watching people talk. People around me are laughing and I don't know why they're laughing because I'm. I'm not in the zone with the rhythm. And if you're not in the zone with the rhythm, then it can feel like people who are just talking like, hello, how are you? Uh, you know, but if you're in it, there's so much specificity in there that that makes them very juicy. And there is a lot of subtext. But if you're if you're watching this movie and you're going like, oh, no, they're not doing enough. Oh, no, they they don't know that they can do more like <laughs> Like you, you know, you're in for a hell of a review when, when it's not even like a, I get what he's doing. It just didn't work for me. And here's why it's so, it's so funny that the approach, cause yeah, I think Dave, I think you are right that that's what the reviewer is saying, but what blows me away is that these characters to say that these characters could do more when they're already so loud as characters like to Austin to your point they literally are they they dress like cartoon characters Eli dresses like a cowboy the <laughs> three quarter 90% of the movie he's dressed like ta- like ta- fringe 
cowboy hat cowboy for no reason other than he wrote a western for me at least that's the fun of having these kind of wacky aesthetically kind of off the wall kind of characters then putting them in like intensely sterile kind of two shots where they act kind of just as straight as can be like that juxtaposition is itself the joke so to be like well the character could be like you could do more with the character in terms of characterization it's like you're looking in the wrong place bud like mm-hmm. if you're looking in the dialogue <laughs> for it you might miss it but like look at the actual fucking movie and you're gonna see it like well it's it i, I like when a filmmaker tries to teach the audience how to watch the movie early on. And I feel like that's showing your audience a lot of respect to say, Hey, I know that this is going to be something different from what you normally watch, but I'm going to let you know pretty early on how to settle into this rhythm. I mean, it's like when boyhood came out, I heard so many people that were like, it was just people talking for three hours. And I'm like, well, Richard Linklater lets you know early on with his films, like the, the before trilogy, it's like, it's just Celine and Jesse talking. And he lets you know from scene one that that's what you're watching is these two people talking. If you're not on board for that, this isn't going to be your movie. But he's telling you what the movie is. He's not promising you car chases or uh, anything too extravagant. And Wes Anderson is like, he's letting you know with jokes like Raleigh St. Clair speaking into his tape recorder and talking about Dudley and in, in, in a very <laughs> monotone voice and then saying, he also has an acute sense of hearing and Dudley from across the room going, I'm not colorblind. Am I And Raleigh going, I'm afraid you are like, he's, he's telling you, this is the rhythm. This yeah. is the, you know, he's letting you, he's giving you a chance That's, to go. Yeah. Oh, I get it. Okay. But, but to your point, <laughs> even earlier than that, the, the beginning of the movie, like a book opens up and you read what you're about to see before you see it. Like we're yeah. watching a, a caricature we're watching the book come to life very early on here's exactly what you're gonna get <laughs> <laughs> all right uh the royal tenenbaum strives to be ambitious and homey at once and even though i want to trust that anderson's impulses are pure the movie is so calculating that i could only imagine anderson sitting in some darkened room somewhere toting up the laughs and tears on a child's chalkboard Ugh, I hated that one. I hate that. Keep in mind, this is all to tell you whether or not you should go see this movie. What? Right. What, uh, what is <clears throat> the first part of that sentence is about? He's like, I want, I want Wes Anderson's intentions to be pure. I want to trust like, that Anderson's a, impulses so, so are is pure. Is the movie made with like sinister intent? <laughs> right. Is that, and like, and not for nothing, sorry, this is all to say nothing of the fact that like, if he's keeping track of how many times you laugh or cry, uh, that's somehow in and of itself a bad thing. Like to, as if, as if like a movie that cares about whether or not it makes you feel things is bad. Yeah. Like. This is right up there with when we uh, the 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 reviews for like John Williams movies where it's like John Williams score is like it's it's manipulating the audience to feel emotion and it's like you mean succeeding at what he's setting out to do is that what you mean right you mean you mean succeeding at making me cry at the right moment okay yeah sometimes people will uh, give a critique of something that I like and I won't necessarily disagree with it. it's exactly that like. I, I I dated a girl once who uh, told me that her problem with I think you should leave is that Tim Robinson's just yelling the whole time. And I went, yes. <laughs> yeah. I said, yeah, he is yelling the whole time and it's great. <laughs> I was like, you're not wrong. I said, you're not wrong that it's a lot of Tim Robinson yelling. But I like the way Tim Robinson sounds when he yells. And he's also pulling off. It's a Jim Carrey-esque like pulling off a, a heightened performance that like not a lot of people could pull off like a level of, of going to 11 that not a lot of uh, comedic performers could pull off. And that's exactly here. It's like when people go, I find Wes Anderson to be very calculating mm-hmm. and very, and I'm like, no, you're not wrong, but the guy is doing exactly what he means to do as a filmmaker, you know? Yeah. I'm- what what upsets me though, is that it is, is, is what the, the writer implies there is that like that calculation is therefore like nefarious right like like to 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 say that there you can either be of pure intent which is basically the implication of that sentence being 
uh, to, to make a movie free of pure intent is to not care whether or not people get emotionally vested in that movie. That's a that's a bad movie. You've made a bad movie <laughs> yeah. if you if you make it without regard to whether or not people have feelings as a result of that movie. Like one of one of the things I love about the Royal Tenenbaums is it it it's completely manipulating me into feeling something, and it to me it puts its finger right where it needs to, right when I need it to. So like one of my favorite scenes in the entire movie, it's one of my favorite scenes in all Wes Anderson dumb is Richie coming home and Margot picking him up on the Green Line bus. And that scene is incredibly emotionally manipulative. That that needle drop is perfectly timed. And the sailors walking by in the background, it's doing going into slow motion. It's doing everything to give you this moment of visual storytelling to tell you what these characters mean to each other. And the it's the director is being incredibly specific with that moment. He wants you to notice that moment and he wants you to feel that moment. And I'm totally all right with that. I'm yeah, totally exactly. Right. That's yeah. gr like that's fine with me. I wonder if this yeah. reviewer watching like a John Woo movie goes like, I I like to think that he was pure of intent when he set those doves free at that moment, <laughs> or if he was deliberately manipulating me to feel something right before an action sequence was about to begin. It feels calculated. It feels, mm -hmm. yeah. It's you're making it. You're making a movie. I like, don't. I don't trying... think that Wes Anderson uh, manipulated me in any way. But I. I genuinely think that when I first saw my wife for the first time, I heard Nico's these days play, and everything moved into slow motion. And I'm just sitting there, looking through my sunglasses, going like, "Oh, who is that? Like, what is the alternative? A movie that's not even like. Oh, I don't even care what you get out of this. Like, I, I, we're." You know, guy here, girl here, and then they talk and yeah. You know. Or like I just like gee whiz, I sure hope all the the moments that I want to hit hit properly. You have full I guess control. We'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah, like, you yeah. can you can decide what happens here. And I, you I'm have that sorry. Power. <laughs> every top 100 list of like greatest movie moments has some level of like, and then the music hit here. The mm -hmm. the framing was in this way, or we wanted it to look this way. But no, apparently not. According to this, it was all it's all nefarious. Yeah. yeah, there's sincerity. This, this person is describing execution, like yeah, properly right, right. executed scenes. Vision, vision, and execution. Yeah. yeah. Oh, here we go. Mm -hmm. uh, Anderson is the kind of director who, with his quirky awkwardness, quirky awkwardness, puts distance between his movies and the audience instead of collapsing it. Some people enjoy his style and bridge the distance easily. Others, like me, may feel that he's more interested in his own precocity, preco precocity. I wouldn't. I don't know how to pronounce that. Um, than his own. Than he is in his own characters. At least, thank you, Austin. In the movies, in the and every time we do this podcast, the lack of self awareness of the reviewers to say like this may work for some people, didn't work for me. Like, at least this is a step in the right direction, because so many of these reviewers are like, I don't even understand how anyone could like John Carpenter's The Thing. It's awful. Yeah. Objectively yeah. awful. And it's like, what? no, <laughs> yeah. you, you must know people will get bad. it. Yeah. 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 I actually think this is the first time. I mean, uh, sharp eyed fans might point out when I'm wrong here, but uh, this might be the first time somebody has openly just said, like. A lot of people like it. A lot of people don't. Yeah, my first thought there was, oh, good for him for at least knowing that, hey, this it works for some people. It doesn't for me. That's a thing that I say a lot about directors that take big swings like this. Directors that, are, you know, um, you know, I really like Alex Garland. I really like Ari Aster. And I feel like their last two films didn't invite me in like the others had. Like I couldn't get into men the same way that I could get into Annihilation or Devs. I couldn't get into Bo is Afraid the same way that I could get into Midsommar or Hereditary. And it almost felt like the directors sort of like left me behind and went into their own world and like didn't my, didn't care if I could come along or not. But also it's like that might just be my, my problem with that particular movie is like it's still there for me to get into if I, you know, yeah. But also my my attention to listen to your critique of a movie is incredibly dependent. Like like if you I've liked the previous stuff. Uh, I am a fan. 
Here's why this one didn't work for me. I will listen with so much more attention than someone who's just like, I haven't liked anything the Coen brothers have done. You right. know, like it. Then it's like, st stop reviewing Coen Brothers movies. Right. <laughs> oh, the, our Star Wars review, the guy was like, I've never been fond of TV or sci fi. And I'm like, then why are you yeah. doing this? Why are you putting yourself through this? My my friends have a podcast where they um, uh, they talk about Star Trek, but on one of their episodes, every once in a while, they'll they'll depart and do like a movie that they watch that has nothing to do with Star Trek. And recently, they watched The Batman, and they had to make it more fair. They one of my friends invited his girlfriend, who just hates <laughs> Batman and hates superheroes and, and hates superhero movies, and it was so interesting to hear. Like they finished the movie and they went around the horn and they were like, what did everyone think? You know, and it was all their first time watching it. Uh, the Robert Pattinson movie, the, the Batman. And it got to her and she just was like, what about this character do you guys like? Like, what yep. about this is interesting? Oh. And I literally as a listener was like, oh, God, like if you if it's not there, then I I, I no, don't know. Like, no, I can't no. help you. I've you, I've yeah. I've sung this a, a million times. I did not like the Batman because the way they're portraying him in the movie is that halfway through the movie, he's going to go, this has been a horrible idea because he fucks up like left and right. If you're not previously invested in the Batman character, if you're not like, oh, I love, oh God, you want to see Batman, Batman and do the hook and the punching and the blah, blah, blah. And you're just watching a trust fund kid kind of like not solve the crime, uh, almost get blown up. Um, stand there while somebody else uh while the main villain gets himself turned in uh stands there while the penguin goes like what are you an idiot like that's not spanish like like he doesn't even he doesn't solve the shit and then he stands there while he finds out that gotham is about to be flooded like it's all leading up to this awesome moment where like i really wish that it had gone like Oh shit, this was a whole I'm just gonna like give money to charity. This like modern, you know, meme of like Batman should have spent his money differently. The movie is setting up that he's gonna do that, but then at the end it's like, no, nah, but he's gonna Batman and he's gonna punch harder and he's gonna get yeah. through it. And I'm like, why? Yeah. Nothing you did worked. All right. Uh, bu -bu -bu -bu. <clears throat> There's sincerity in Anderson's approach if you have the temperament and the energy to look past his constant smirking to see it. Already my goodwill is gone. The goodwill that they've that they've set up because they were like, some people get it, some people don't, but you know how he's always smirking. The Royal Tenenbaums especially makes the pretty hard uh, makes that pretty hard work. Anderson spends a great deal of time introducing the characters and explaining their histories. These vignettes establish a delicately morose mood that the rest of the movie doesn't live up to. Look, going back to the smirking thing, too, like this is this is what stylistic directors do. This is what Quentin Tarantino does in every one of his movies is he goes, hey, welcome to a Quentin Tarantino movie. Get on the ride. And I'm going <laughs> to yeah. constantly be reminding you that you're at a Quentin Tarantino movie. Right. And if you're either into it or you're not, you're there are there are directors who hang back and let the actors and the story be the thing and let that be the focal piece. I, I kind of think that that's the kind of director Richard Linklater is. He's sort of a guy that can make many different styles and kinds of movies because he hangs back. I think Steven Soderbergh is sort of that way because he's just interested in form and just changing different things. But then there are certain directors that you go to watch their movies and it's like part of the movie is going to be David Fincher, David Finchering. Like that's going to be part of the movie and you're either into that or you're not, what you know? Do you, like what are they, are, are you, do you watch the first 30 minutes of a Wes Anderson movie and go like, he's going to, he's going to get tired of this and it's going to be a regular movie pretty soon. <laughs> like what do you <laughs> think is going to happen? Out. Yeah, 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 yeah. He'll, he'll dial it back. Let, let's let it, him run around a little movie, bit. Yeah. Eventually he's going to run out of static shots with, you know, frames in the background. Um, and, and again, going back to the teaching the audience how to watch the movie thing, like the opening prologue with Alec Baldwin narrating tell, tells you immediately right out of the gate what you're in store for. And then cast of characters 20 years later with everyone centered in their shot saying Gene Hackman is Royal Tenenbaum. Mm -hmm. And like it's telling you immediately this is the world of the film. 
you, we are inviting you to get on the ride. If you refuse, if you are going to roll your eyes and lean back, then you're not going to have a good time. You're not going to have a fun time on the ride. But we're telling you immediately, we're not hiding hiding anything from you. This is the world. This is the movie. This is from a different review that we're totally not going to have time to get to, but uh, I wanted to read it. The extended pre-credit sequence of the Royal Tenenbaums is quite amusing, provided you can put up with a 10-minute version of Hey Jude performed in the background. That's it again. It, it's, it's this idea of like, ah. like if you can sit through, like, yeah, first of all, I can. I can. Yeah. I think Hey Jude is <laughs> 10 minutes part, long. To clear. Yeah. Right. <laughs> the the song, you, you're saying, can I listen to a Beatles song for 10 minutes? But like, like clearly that's a, that's somebody who's like, I didn't expect it to keep being a Wes Anderson movie. I didn't expect that. Fun bit of trivia there. Uh, so Wes Anderson had hired Elliot Smith to write a bunch of Beatles covers to be part of this oh, wow. soundtrack. And Elliot Smith was too strung out on heroin to actually complete the job. So they wound up doing that instrumental version and they used his song Needle in the Hay for the suicide scene. Yeah. Elliot was still alive at wow. the time that they I were making know this that. film. I, I checked and that so it, recently. Yeah. It became a very prophetic oh. use of the song and it makes that that scene tell, all the more. I'll tell you, that. Austin, you're right. That was a very fun fact. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one little fact. All right. F for one thing, yeah. though, it's splashed with color. The Royal Tenenbaums is too flat to be vivid. Each shot is like an inert oh. comic book panel. <laughs> And without the intentional angularity that Terry Swigoff achieved in Ghost World. Ghost World? There it is. We're not hitting the heights of Ghost World. I'm sorry, Wes Anderson fans. Royal Tenenbaums is a poor man's Ghost World. You heard it here first. For yeah. those of you who had comparison to a worse movie, mark it off on your bingo cards. <laughs> it happens in nearly every review, Austin. I don't know why they think that they can do this. Yeah. How, how very dare they. My personal gonna... favorite was, uh, yeah, Raiders is fine, but man, I was just wishing for a little more Gunga Din <laughs> in the middle of my Raiders on the Lost Star. It's faux folk art. There's no dramatic electricity to draw you in or set you buzzing. With few exceptions, the characters' feelings and motivations are put on screen in an expository rather than visceral way. Most of the characters, particularly Stillers, feel vague and unshaped. The device of dressing the present-day characters in grown-up versions of the same clothes they wore as kids feels forced and gimmicky. He of all people. Ben Stiller's character of all people. How dare they? Yep. Like, yeah. Of all the characters in the movie, the character that has maybe the best and most complete arc in the entire movie. And it's an arc that, hey, you could be sitting there watching the movie for the first time going, what's going on with this character? Why is he so, such an asshole? Why is he such a stickler? But by the time you get to the end of the movie, and it shouldn't really be that hard to pick up on the fact that, like, they tell you right away, like, his wife just died and he's having a hard time processing it and he's really afraid about the safety of his kids. And also, his whole life growing up, his dad was stabbing him in the back uh, over and over and over again, so he's got trust issues. And so he's very walled off and closed off and afraid of connection i mean early on like when when uh richie's trying to tell him you know hey you're my brother and i love you you know and he and he goes stop saying that and it just shows that <laughs> Chaz has a hard time with vulnerability with i mean like of yeah, all the characters all you could pick <laughs> yeah uh, but Hackman's royal, crusty, enchantingly off-putting, is the one character who resonates every time he's on screen. But Hackman's turn only points up the monotonous, failed jokes that make the royal Tenenbaums so top-heavy and ultimately topple it. A gag involving a gypsy cab is hilarious the first time and exhausting by the eighth. What, was that a gag? It's He's just creating recurring... his own alternate version of New York City. Right. So there is a company called Gypsy Cab Co. There's a company called the Green Line Bus Company. These are right. these are not real things. Even the 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 Ys that exist, the 365th Street Y. Why? Yeah. That's not a, a place in New York City. And 365th Street. 365th Street Y <laughs> is not, you know, and he's creating his own 
version of New York City. And in this version of New York City, Gypsy Cab Co. exists. And it's just right. it's it's just accepted by the characters. So it's not a, a gag that every time it comes up, he wants you to laugh or giggle. Uh, it's, it's just a thing it's in just, the world. It's just a part of <sighs> Wes Anderson's. For this writer to be yeah. watching this movie and see, like, towards the end of the movie, Royal getting out of a gypsy cab and him out loud going like, ah, we get it. Gypsy right. cab. We yeah. all get it. There are times no. in the reviews where where you, you go like, oh, you just you just showed me that you're watching the movie for complete completely different reasons than I am <laughs> like and there's times when like the thing that they criticize is so like that's your problem oh okay okay we're not even watching the same movie that's cool awesome great got it there were dozens of times I'd find myself staring in disbelief at the screen realizing that joke after joke was brilliant and yet I barely laughed at all Chaz's Dalmatian mice, tiny spotted scampering things, should have been one of the finest mi finest miniature visuals of the year. But when I saw them, they just seemed planted and obvious, a detail so carefully mechanized to delight us that it simply doesn't. The jokes in Royal Tenenbaums don't tickle you, they wallop you. I mean, I... I, I... <sighs> I, I think mean, it's the opposite because I feel like the rhythm is very understated. And I think it, I mean, this is just a matter of like, if you're very used to cinematic comedy having a very specific delivery and rhythm, and you're watching something like this, again, this is the third film in his catalog. People were not acquainted. They're still not. I still go to see Wes Anderson movies in the theater, and I'm one of the only people laughing at punchlines. And I can, I, 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 when I went and saw the French Dispatch, there's that scene where Bob Balaban and um, Adrian Brody are talking about the art piece that they're sure is brilliant because the the artist who's good at art says it's brilliant. And, uh, you know, and Bob Balaban's going, I'm not getting it. What am I not getting? And he goes, you're not supposed to get it. it you know, and, then, you know, <laughs> and it's a hilarious That's the scene. Point. And I'm like dying laughing at this scene. And the people in the row next to me were looking at me like, what does he get? And in my brain, I'm going, what are you doing here? Because I saw this movie <laughs> yeah, on opening weekend and I was like, do you not know who this is? Do you, have you never seen a Wes Anderson movie before? Yeah. And are you unfamiliar at this point with these rhythms and like this style of, of comedy? Every single time I've seen one of his movies in the theater, there are people in the theater who seem to be confused about like what it, about what specifically about this type of delivery is supposed to be humorous and i guess you either get it or you don't i but. do i do understand though uh where they're coming from um of walking into a wes anderson movie thinking it's something else because when i went to see the isle of dogs my movie ticket you know how like it kind of curtails it cuts off the the full title of the movie it just said yeah. the isle of do which i thought felt like a self-help seminar so maybe people <laughs> were like you know like i can i'm gonna go to the isle mm -hmm. of do it is we it's weird at this point to be at a, a Wes Anderson opening weekend yeah. and have people in the audience who seem to have never heard of him before and seem to be watching one of these movies for the first time confused about what's going on. I'm wired to entertainment news, knowing what's coming out, having a finger on the pulse. Are we the minority? Are Does the average person still just kind of go like, this title sounds cool, I'm no. going to go spend $20, $30? I very firmly believe that nobody accidentally watches a Wes Anderson movie. Like you are either there because you want to watch Wes Anderson or Someone's someone someone wanted you. to watch Wes Anderson made you go there. <laughs> yeah. Um I don't I don't think someone goes, "Well, let's check out what Asteroid City is about." Um I think one I too many people have Google, right? Like yeah. You got to take a look. At, first off, Wes Anderson is everywhere. Everyone knows who Wes Anderson is, right? Am I am I that in that big a bubble that uh, people don't know? There are people in this world who don't know Wes Anderson. You've got me. I'm folding in on myself now. You've got me <laughs> questioning whether or not I'm I'm exactly who you're worried about being. Well, like, it, it, in the year 2001, when this came out, and I remember the first time I saw this movie, I was about 14 years old, and I will admit that at 14 years old. 
going into a film that had Bill Murray and Ben Stiller and all these comedians that I recognized in it, I expected to be laughing a lot more. And I remember watching it as a teenager and not laughing out loud a lot and going like, oh, I am I not getting this? And it took me till the second time I watched it to understand and readjust. I was also a teenager, but now it's like every time I watch it, I laugh the entire movie. And I love quoting this movie with friends and just like everything that Eli says makes me laugh. Like I, I you know, right. I think that it's one of Owen Wilson's like funniest performances. You think I'm especially not a genius? <laughs> uh, I didn't even have to think about, didn't it, didn't think about it. Don't listen to me. I'm on mescaline. That's a great line. Uh, yeah, no, I had the same. We've already talked about this movie, but I had kind of a similar reaction to uh, Big Lebowski. The first time I watched it, I was thoroughly confused. And then I, the second time I, I watched it, it clicked. And I was like, this might be one of my, and it is one of my favorite movies of all time. I um, think there's something about, um, because when I was young, I would watch the Carson show and not understand why Johnny Carson was funny. And I didn't get it, but mm-hmm. I didn't go like, this isn't funny. I was like, I'm a kid. I don't get the references. I know I want to aspire to get this. And I felt that way growing up watching the Simpsons. It's like, I don't, I don't know what these, what, what they're referencing, what movies and TV shows are referencing. I don't know what this is a, a deconstruction of. I don't know, but it's 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 very animated, not animated, but like it, it's working very, very hard. And it's and I can tell just by osmosis that it's doing a good job at what it's setting out to do. I aspire to understand it. And I felt the same way when I saw Royal Tenenbaums, where it's like these are these are a lot of my favorite actors and they're doing something different that I don't get yet. Rather than have the audacity to say they're all wrong. I know that I have something to grow into to figure out what it is that they're doing and to either appreciate it or say that it's not for me, but to be like, Oh no, it's wrong at face value is just like, and I think that that's like a a thing that like, you have to grow up a certain way where you go like, I don't get it now, but I'm gonna, and I want to. Well, and it seems like this reviewer is recognizing well-written material. Mm -hmm. He's recognizing like, oh, these are gold. There's so many good jokes here. They're just not landing the way I want them to. And it's like, okay, yeah. So you need to recalibrate because these are being delivered in a, in a way that you are not used to them being delivered, but you are, there's something in you that's recognizing that what's here is good, that it's good material. It's just not landing for you. And, you know, I mean, sometimes that happens with stand-up comedy, that you'll watch someone that your friend says is hilarious, and it's just, if they're different enough, if someone's telling you Andy Kaufman makes me pee my pants laughing, and then you go and watch an Andy Kaufman uh, performance, and you go, what the hell is happening here? And it's like, well, you got to calibrate to what he's <clears throat> doing before it'll start working for you, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, when we talk about uh, Steve Zissou, Life Aquatic, when I first saw it, because it was the first uh, Wes Anderson movie that I saw after Tenenbaums, I hated it and swore off it and watched it maybe about 10 years later and was like, this is his best movie. It's so good. The, it's <laughs> I, so yeah. good. It's, it's one of his worst reviewed films. And it's and, yeah. and 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 again, like I've had enough experiences in my life where where like I'll watch something once. My favorite stand up comedian, our mutual friend Casey, and I believe you uh told me I should listen to Stuart Lee. And I listened to a little bit of him and I'm like, This is stupid. And then I just waited a bit, was in a different headspace, and gave it another shot, and I'm like, This is the best stand up I've ever heard. And it's as soon as you have an experience where you are completely turned around because you're in a different headspace and the art is the same, it hasn't changed, but like you're in a different headspace, you're ready to receive it. Uh, all right. So, uh, couple, two more paragraphs. Anderson's movies have the innocence of a crayon drawing, which is part of what some moviegoers like about him. Not true. His ramshackle charm comes with a price. Also not true. Anderson's movies are uh, assertively asexual. They exist in a world where nothing so messy as sex intrudes, except at the most basic childlike crush level. What are you I, talking about? I was about? saying last night watching the film, I don't know if Gwyneth Paltrow has ever been hotter in a film than uh, Margot Tenenbaum. Like, 
there's something about that character that is I think it's the sexiest thing in any Wes Anderson film too. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but yeah. also like there's no sex. Okay. Sometimes yeah. the movie doesn't have tits. And this movie does have tits. And it there's, does. Yeah. Oh, oh, by the way, I got one more thing that we'll read real quick that I think you're going to let. It, yeah. the, the, the idea of like, like to watch a Wes Anderson movie and then get mad that co the conventions that you expect from regular film aren't present here. It, it says so much about you where you're like, and, and where is the where is the sex scene? Like that says so much about you that you watch a Wes Anderson movie and go like, and on top of everything, I, I made a video once on uh, on TikTok about movie reviewers who are mad that a movie isn't something else. Where the, so it was like people being like, yeah, I watched Titanic recently. Would it have killed them to have a car chase somewhere in there? Like you know, just something like <laughs> there's all these cars on the boat. You could have done a car chase, you know, or like <laughs> I watched The Shining, and you know what? Not a single musical number in the entire movie. It shows up a lot. Why wasn't there X? And yeah. the answer is always because the movie didn't need that. Why would there be that? Why the... like, and, and to to say that there isn't. Because there is no sex scene, there is therefore no like chemistry in this movie. That there is no, you don't feel for a relationship between Margot and Richie is like. There are some times where we read these reviews, and I'm like, okay, you didn't want to enjoy this movie, so you came in. Uh, yeah, like, the the my favorite of the this wasn't the movie that I wanted it to be was the guy when we were reviewing the thing because it came out the same weekend as E. T. Who mm -hmm. who was like. It doesn't have the hopeful optimism of E.T. I'm like, it's not that movie. It's telling a different story. I was kind of hoping that there could be like a heartwarming scene where the thing eats some Reese's pieces. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it's like, why? So, so what? So in your mind, you want every movie that came out this week about aliens to be to have the same heartwarming. Aw, shucks. We'll we'll win in the end. Like, how about a different movie? And there, there's no there's no lack of awareness that like that, like in 20, 30 years, people are just going to be able to watch these movies independently from what is happening on either side of it or what's happening in the time. You know, like what if you don't want to watch a movie with sex that that has a sexual component or, or, or an overtly sexual component? Wouldn't you like want to watch a movie like that? And wouldn't this be a movie where you could do that? Criticisms of movies where they just don't have a thing that the movie doesn't necessarily need to have. Like movies don't owe you just saying, why doesn't this movie have a car chase scene? It's like, cause not every movie has a car chase scene. Why doesn't this movie have more sex in it? Cause not every movie needs to have more sex in it. This movie, did, but, but of all of the movies in Wes Anderson's ca uh, catalog, this probably has the most sexually charged storyline with the transgressiveness of the Richie Margot. Like I remember as a kid, like, there's a reason why uh, step sibling porn is this category that it is. <laughs> and there's something about the transgressiveness of like brushing up against incest, but not being like full blown incest. It's like, it's my stepsister or my, st my stepmom. It's not my actual mom. It's, it's adjacent to this thing. That's really a, a, a social tableau. And this movie really like steps into that water of like, are you okay with what's going on here with these two siblings that were raised as siblings, but they're not related by blood. And there's something about just that kiss that they have in his tent. That is like, it's a hot kiss. Like it's a, you know, like, and it's charged and there's a lot of tension built up throughout the movie of them barely touching each other and barely being able to speak to each other leading to that. That's like, I mean, of all the films of his to accuse of being sexless, this is probably the worst one to pick, you know? And and it's a perfect example of what I love about Wes Anderson movies and this one in particular, where like, it's not going to go exactly where you want it to. It may go into some dark territory where like he's staring in the mirror and he says, I'm going to kill myself tomorrow. Like the movie is not going to give you the package that you kind of maybe are hoping for or rooting for. It's going to take these characters into different territory. This story being told I don't think we're going to we're not going to get to it, but there's a couple of reviewers who are like, you know, nothing bad happens. Everything is always like wrapped up and it's like. Ab a, absolutely not. And B, you know, 
you are missing the drama. You are missing the moments where choices are made and and horrific things are happening. Dudley walking in and 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 seeing. Um, yeah, that's a wild criticism. Nothing bad happens in that movie. <laughs> it's like there's just no drama. A dog dies. You don't kill dogs in movies. You don't. A dog gets dogs. run yeah. over by a car. Yeah, unless it's yeah. The Thing and Royal Tenenbaums. Those are the two movies. If there are <laughs> essential, if there are essential, this is the last paragraph. If there are essential nooks and crannies of human experience that Anderson finds yucky and off-putting, his alleged brilliance is going to hit the ceiling pretty soon. Meanwhile, though, his overconfident feyness, generally unbecoming in any artist above the age of eight, is already wearing thin. Fuck you. Like those rarefied, assertively cute mice, he's showing his spots. It's up to us whether to buy them or not. Well, I, I hated I mean, that. When they start to get, like, personal is when it really freaks me out. When it goes from like, I don't know if this movie was my cup of tea, to like, this director has to get their shit together. I, I love a director and a filmmaker who every time I, especially movies that I love, movies that I've seen 20, 30, 40 times in my life, and every time I watch the movie, there's so much care and attention to detail that I find something new to appreciate every single time. And even last night, it was no exception. The movie starts out, and I noticed that young Margot is reading Chekhov. And Chekhov is known as this sort of, like, changing the dynamic of what modern... He created modern theater and, like, what was possible in a, in a play. And also, it's very ensemble-based stuff. And this movie is... this on, It's very Chekhovian, uh, the Royal Tenenbaums is, and, like, the rhythms of the way that he writes. And I'd never noticed that before. I'd never... I can't believe I missed this one. I'd never made the connection that Royal buys him a Dalmatian at the end of the movie yep. and Chaz had made Dalmatian mice. So this this guy who's so hung up on the mice, he's so hung up on the Dalmatian mice and how come they weren't used better? And I'm like, it it lands perfectly with that um, that brilliant moment between Chaz and Royal that his dad not only gets him a new dog, but gets him a dog that says, I've always known how brilliant you were and I've always seen you. I could have gotten you any dog, but I found you a dog that says to you, I know you made those mice, and I yeah. know that you did that when you were a kid, and I, I've i always appreciated how smart you were, you know? No, unfortunately, I think you're wrong. Apparently, he's a child. Apparently, yeah. Wes Anderson is is barely above the age of eight, and his gimmick is, rare, is, is wearing thin. I mean, we just went through a, a long list of kind of heavy scenes in this movie. And like, it, I always think it's a little unfair to hold a reviewer to the standard of like other movies. But I, I don't think uh, Wes Anderson has ever shied away in subsequent films from like heavy scenes, despite having a somewhat kind of sterile approach to shot composition but but like covers like pretty serious top like uh you know what one of my my personal favorite movie of, of his is moonrise kingdom i think very underrated uh personally but uh you know the fact that he makes the main character an orphan and like they go into that like in a very serious way they both run away from home because of like broken dynamics in their family he's never been afraid to handle those things mm -hmm. like and to explore that, in, to, to explore family dynamics in Royal Tenenbaums the way he does, then again, Moonrise Kingdom, it's like there's, it's just, um, to to call him childish in his filmmaking is, it's it's moments like these where I'm like, like you, you, you've, you've chosen a group of scenes that you think are emblematic of the entire movie without having like considered the entire movie as a, as a, as a whole. And again, it's like there is a childlike wonder in the way that he approaches filmmaking. You know, there is a sort of like there's a magic to it. There's a magic realism. There's this other world that he's creating and playing in. But, yeah, I mean, he's not shying away from from anything uh, big or serious. He's he's talking about uh, World War Two and, and, and the Nazis and the Grand Budapest Hotel in in Steve Zissou, the whole reason why Ned shows up in the first place is because his mom just died of suicide, and he wants to go and see and find this guy that he thinks might be his dad. And then, like, I mean, the scene in that movie when Ned dies is like is is brutal. Yeah, it's brutal. You know, Bill Murray carrying him out of the ocean and just like the movie is not afraid to get this really kind of like 
whimsical cartoonish movie is not afraid to hit the brakes and really hit you hard with some serious subject matter but it yeah hits. darjeeling too darjeeling's all yeah. about a broken relationship with your mother well, the whole movie is, is I mean, a, a journey to the mother like like it's, yeah and and i i agree like he does approach these movies and like he directs his movies in a way that are that have this kind of childlike and i think part of that comes from what these movies i don't know if this is where where his composition or his dp kind of style comes from but it always reminds me of those um those old like um sorry what are they called wildlife kind of dissection books like an almost anatomy books or, or like like where it breaks something down to look like a blueprint where it'll have like the little pointer things like identifying mm -hmm. sections of figures like that kind of style it is how like a child reads those books mm -hmm. to understand how a clock works it's broken down by springs and laid out in a way where it's all beautifully like organized um but yeah in moonrise kingdom my favorite line in in any of his movies is just so fucking heavy and it comes from like a nine-year-old kid where uh susie the young girl says that she wishes she was an orphan because it always feels like her lives their lives are more special and the boy who is an orphan says i love you but you don't know what you're talking about and her response is i love you too it's nah, it's so it, perfect it's yeah. just the best it's yeah. the best on so many levels that scene hits so hard and the movie is literally like it couldn't be more clearly kind of shot from the perspective of children um, and done with a kind of childlike understanding. I just think Wes Anderson really, of all the directors to criticize as being like, or comparing to being childish, uh, like he does just enough where I get where the, where the, in, like the dig comes from. But it's a very unfair to me. Criticism. We've talked about it, but it's the juxtaposition of of the the childlike two D caricature cartoon, and then when those moments hit, it 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 affects you differently than in any other. Look, if someone dies in a Paul Verhoeven movie, it barely even registers. In Darjeeling Limited, when they're running with the kids that have just drowned, mm -hmm. it's heartbreaking yeah, it's because of uh, because of the aesthetic that the movie has maintained and almost this like innocent like almost like the suggestion that nothing bad is ever going to happen nothing is ever going to uh, assault this this beautiful painting mm. when when the shit goes down in a Wes Anderson movie it it affects you differently because you are not expecting it and i think that's the that's the point and that's you know you you, you watch somebody die in a, a tarantino movie or, or a, a, a scorsese movie it's like ah, oh, yeah, you know yeah, yeah you know but when when shit happens in a wes anderson movie bam he has a great uh way with those moments too of having characters say things that feel like they don't really make sense or speak you know like adrian brody goes goes, I lost mine. I couldn't save mine. I couldn't, you know, and, and he's just sort of speaking very direct, but it's just sort of the, and it's kind of like the, I, I'm going to kill myself tomorrow thing yeah. of just sort of like so many people watch that and they go, why did he say tomorrow? And it's like, it's just this little detail of like him making this decision, but then kind of going, never mind. But because your brain's weird... not working perfectly in this moment, you're not thinking clearly and you, and you would in a movie, you'd say the right thing, but in reality, you wouldn't necessarily say the right thing but it's also it's like if you're you gotta really pay it in a movie that is that meticulously crafted in any wes anderson movie you really gotta the, the the filmmaker again is asking you to lean forward and pay attention because everything's gonna be right there for you in darjeeling one of the funniest things and also saddest things is like from the jump all three of these brothers are just like pounding drugs to to help them with their grief they're all grieving their dad that died and they're all just the entire movie taking painkillers and like and you know and drinking and just trading the whole, them around yeah trading them around <laughs> the different painkillers that they're all taking and stuff and it's sort of played as a as a gag and as a bit but it's also like no they're they're all in immense pain 
right now, you know, yeah. and uh, really struggling. Well, I always thought that that line, yeah, that line comes across as weird, the, the I couldn't save mine. It always, yeah, it does come across as weird, but I think that's part of, I think that works well, so well with that character too, in particular, uh, just because this movie is about three brothers who like, they're constantly kind of, they see things as done in a collective, like, you know, to the drugs, they're sharing these drugs. Everything is passed around. Like there is a, there is your share. And like, he saw that as his third of the responsibility in that, in that moment. It was, I couldn't do my part. Um, I always thought that, yeah, that line comes across as odd on paper, but I love, I love, I love that. Uh, it's great. So, I, in terms of characterization, I hate that scene from an emotional standpoint. So the review is over. I have one quick review that I want to read and see if you can clock. It's subtle, but see if you can spot the moment that is completely inappropriate in this quick review here. Uh, and then we'll move to the end of the of the of the podcast. But <clears throat> I'm going to read the whole thing and let's see if you guys can spot this moment. The Spectator, March 16, 2002. The Royal Tenenbaums was set up to be a sleeper. Open in a few cities in December, get good reviews and word of mouth, pick up some Oscar nominations, and round about now be doing great business everywhere. But somehow it didn't work out, and on Oscar night, it's only up for unimportant stuff, non-box office. There are good lines, lots of great moments, Gwyneth Paltrow in a quickie lesbian interlude and a dandy so soundtrack, but there's not much drama, <laughs> and such plot as exists hinges on sentimental and manipulative cliches that have been at odds with the script's ambitions. Did so, you catch... yeah, the guys, there's some good moments. In one scene, Gwyneth Paltrow <laughs> hooking up with a chick. <laughs> I read That's... that, and I was like, are you serious? It's two th I know it's I know it's 23 years ago. Really? That gets by? But also, that's effectively the only actual part of the movie that ever gets described in this review. Yeah, that's it's the only like four thing seconds in the movie that in, ever in, gets in a described. in a flashback that really is only one of like nine points that are made about Margot's past that have no bearing whatsoever. Which that's also just a wonderfully constructed little montage. The montage of her and all of her lovers Incredible. is so red. So oh, it's fantastic. Right up I, there with with uh, Ethleen's um, uh, suitors, just yeah, cutting. Oh, totally, totally. <laughs> I love, I love like the moment in the montage where the guy that was interviewing Eli. Uh, on the TV show where he is says that... Wildcat is also feeling up <laughs> Margo. <laughs> He's one of the lovers <laughs> in the montage. And it's like, what a great little thing that if you're not paying attention, you won't yeah. know. Yeah. Like, hey, yeah. <laughs> it's that guy. <laughs> so funny. But could you imagine reading that review and knowing nothing about this movie and being like, well, I guess it's a movie about a woman who uh, goes, goes, uh, has a, a same sex relationship and Danny Glover rounds out the cast, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's it's literally like a two second shot. Yeah. Of, oh, it couldn't yeah. be. It could yeah. <laughs> that's what you you clocked is like, I'm gonna mention that in the review. I just it blew my mind. I was I was just sort of bored the whole movie and then for like a few seconds uh Gwyneth Paltrow touched a girl's boob and I sort of perked up a little bit but uh before we uh before we close out here do, does everybody have a favorite line from the Royal Tenenbaums? God. While you're thinking I'll do mine. It's it's a scene um you trying to steal my woman Hank? What? You heard me Coltrane. <laughs> Coltrane. You heard me Coltrane. <laughs> what? Did you just call me Coltrane? No. <laughs> you didn't. No. But if I did, you wouldn't be able to do anything about it. Now, would you? The fact that he backs off, the mm -hmm. fact that he's called out on on his racism and he backs away just by being like, did you just call me Coltrane? I think is it's some of the best acting I've ever seen. Look at that old grizzly bear. <laughs> yeah, that's a. Yeah, I. I don't know if this is my favorite line in the entire movie. Uh, I think that we've had a rough year, Dad. I know you have Chazzy is yeah. a very, very strong contender. But mm -hmm. one of my favorite moments in the entire movie that gets me every single time is, is he worth a damn? I believe so. <laughs> it's just that, just that <laughs> yeah. little, I just love that, the, that it, 
question and response. Is he worth a damn? I believe so. I mean, the bomber <laughs> in general is just this like he doesn't have a lot of lines in the movie, but when he does, oh God! I mean, the whole he's taken off his shoes and one of his socks. <laughs> he's so great. I I was thinking about this. I mean, when I was uh, like working with Luke and getting to know him, I was thinking about this. I was like, this was like his third performance in a film ever. Wow! Uh, and I think it's so impressive how detailed. I, I, I kind of think it's his best work. I kind of think in his career, like it's such an underrated and understated performance from him. Yeah. And I think that like Richie to me is such a important character for just f for me personally, but his execution of finding all the ways to show you everything that's going on with Richie with very, very little uh, on the surface, you know, and uh, like him punching through the glass window and getting up and, you know what? What do you want to do? Find <laughs> yeah, the guy? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a controlled performance, and as an actor, you know, like the the most important thing is like deliberacy, and that is his every moment of that, of everything he does in that movie is incredibly deliberate and and meticulous, and just I mean, the outfit is just. I've got a uh, in terms of favorite quotes. I've got a I've got a few. Uh, <laughs> first is royal. Uh, going, I'm terribly sorry for your loss. Your mother was an incredibly attractive woman. <laughs> yes. Such a great, it's an entire it's character who he is. in one It's sentence. who he is. Yeah, yep. It's exactly who he is. That and uh, before I, I have one more, but I, I want to throw in because I'm never going to get this. I don't know when we're going to do another Wes Anderson movie, but Moonrise Kingdom, one of my favorite lines. I, I do it all the time. Uh, to very much the annoyance of my my partner, um, what kind of bird are you? <laughs> I'm a dove. She's a ri no. What kind of bird are you? Is <laughs> the pinnacle of opening lines. It you will never be cooler. What kind of bird are you? It's mm -hmm. the anyway. I'm, I'm gonna say two more really quick. One is pagoda. Both times that he says, "There he goes." Yeah. There he yep. is. Yep. Yep. Oh, there there he goes. <laughs> the, the way that he says it, "There he goes." There he is. Is so good. And also, that's the last time you stick a knife in me. You hear? <laughs> awesome. I, I I I wish that this was the best idea of a podcast that I could come up with. But honest to God, the most fun I've had doing it was when we did our Big Lebowski episode and we started the episode with like, let's just list our top 10 each lines from the movie just so that the whole episode isn't us riffing. We're going to do it. The and whole, it's yeah. the most fun I've ever had doing anything of just going like, you know, show her Shabbos. Like it was just <laughs> And surprisingly, a lot of our, our line, like, and I bet the same thing would happen with Royal Tenenbaums, where, like, I bet our top five, top ten wouldn't overlap because there's so many great lines. Oh, yeah. My, my sorry, my one last before we <laughs> before we move on, I know we got to move on. But my <laughs> other favorite one is is and it's a dark scene. But um, when they're in the hospital and it's not really even a line, but Bill Murray's face when he's uh, pushing when he's behind the gurney pushing uh richie down and uh, and then the line after that which is margo running in to the hospital going dudley where is he and dudley is just covered in richie's blood and he goes who yeah he's <laughs> covered in his blood can the boy tell time oh my lord oh no. my lord no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's also it's a it's a kind of along the lines of the Bill Murray's face. It, it's more of a reaction, but there's something. Um, God, I forget which of the kids, but uh, when when Royal is meeting Chaz's kids, and he goes like, "What do you think about that?" and one of his kids just goes, what? and then it just cuts to like he just interrupts him, <laughs> like he's about to answer. I think that's like every time I see beautiful acting from a kid actor, I'm just like, oh, just oh, it's phenomenal. And that's even a great the way that that's written. Who, which one are you? I'm Ari. Yeah. Uzi, I'm your granddad. So he know like that in the telling the audience in that way, yep. he says so his name good. and then he looks at the other kid and says, Uzi, I'm your granddad. He knows you both. Know? Yeah, he knows both. Yeah. Kids. So yeah. good. Yeah. All right. So this is uh, finishing us up here tonight. Uh, two reviews and a lie. I'm about to read three one star user reviews uh, of Royal Tenenbaums. 
two are f two are real. One of them is fake, and I wrote. And your job is to figure out which one uh, I wrote. Uh, Mick, you had an added bonus uh, that I think is beautiful to add to the game, which is if Mick correctly, oh, you'll both answer, but if Mick correctly answer, answers which one is mine, I have to post it on Rotten Tomatoes as a user review for Royal Tenenbaums with my own name and face attached to it. So I'm terrified. Okay, I love it. I love this. Um, okay, so uh, Royal Tenenbaums, review number one. I see a lot of films, and I'm confident in my ability to pick up on subtle, dark humor. But come on, this film is just awful. I really do think that sometimes it's a case of Emperor's New Clothes, some highbrow, highbrow critic star saying how wonderfully clever and dark this film is, and then when people start agreeing with them, they probably laugh behind our backs. I have never left a film early, but my God, I wanted to in this one. This and Unbreakable, two lousy films praised across the board and i have no idea why that's review number this, one this movie made me feel stupid yep <laughs> i don't like it i love yeah. the addition of another movie another random movie where it's like yeah. this one and unbreakable suck <laughs> number review number two not sure i can really write a review since i didn't officially make it to the through the whole thing maybe it gets better but i doubt it i started watching it because of the box art and thought the cast was spectacular ha all in caps Turns out a movie needs more than star power. It needs the characters to actually show emotion and make the plot happen. It's smart and stylish, but forgets the humor in the process. Though I lied when I said I wouldn't watch it again, I probably will when I need to fall asleep. It's review number two. Dave, can I just say, if you wrote that one, mm -hmm. um, I all I can say is hats off because <laughs> it genuinely hasn't occurred to me to do, to to hit the incredibly small target of not finishing the movie and also bothering to go on Rotten Tomatoes to leave a review. Right. The Venn diagram of that world is... Also, I like the psychology of, though I lied when I said I wouldn't watch it again, he didn't say that. <laughs> he didn't say that he would watch it again. Dave, I hope this one's you. <laughs> Boy, howdy. I mean, that's because... insane. Okay. Okay. And number three, maybe my favorite one ever. Having actors play against type is usually a tried and true way to make a movie interesting, but here it's pointless. Gwyneth Paltrow has stringy hair and smokes cigarettes. Okay, so what? Ben Stiller wears a 70s Adidas tracksuit. Ha ha. Owen Wilson crashes his car into a dog. Man, that was funny slash sad, wasn't it? I'm like a lot of people. I enjoy films like Memento, Run, Run Lola Run, and others like that which break the mold of formula filmmaking a bit but i got sucked in and was a huge and it was a huge waste of money seeing this awful dreadful crap <laughs> those are your I'm three going, reviews i'm going with number three okay. you on number three i'm going okay. with number three i'll tell you what number three reminded me of another great line which is right after eli goes flying through the window into the tenenbaum house the first thing he says is where's my shoe <laughs> oh my god that's so good yeah Bring my shoe. Yeah. That shoe. And Dudley kneels down. Dudley, and presents, has... <laughs> Dudley kneels down and presents him with the I shoe. I mean, real real quick, uh uh make yours like mine. How fascinating. How bizarre. How bizarre. <laughs> I say that all the time. How bizarre. Where's that red one gonna go? <laughs> <laughs> so good. Uh oh. Okay, I'm going to take, you know what? I am going to take number two because I want it to be true. I know that this is a long shot, but I want it to be you. Did you write number two, Dave? I wrote, no, I wrote number two. <laughs> <laughs> Which means I no. have to post that. Shit. <laughs> it is now canon that Dave Colombo has not finished Royal Tenet Bombs. <laughs> Oh, dude! I thought for sure you were doing. Those, I thought you were doing a good send up of the kind of film bro that's like, I've seen some weird movies. Yeah. I've seen Memento. You know, like the kind of person who, like, because they watched and enjoyed Memento, they think that they now appreciate like 
odd cinema. I get it to, now. I love, you Memento's know. a great movie, and I and I love Christopher Nolan, but it's like the kind of person that's like, I understood Inception, and it's like it's okay, you know, like cool. I love Inception, but yeah, like, like you know, but movies get yeah. weirder. It is but, a yeah. real throw, like like a, like a shot in the dark sometimes. Like with the first one, where it's like this and Unbreakable both suck. It's like they throw out these like random movies that are like cool when we first started doing this this game it was hard to like kind of try to write like them because it's so bad and there's like run-on sentences and the we, we found very early that the best way to try to trip each other up is to pretend that we like we oh no i'm having trouble reading this part this is so poorly written and that's the one that you wrote so it's taken a little bit of time but it's it's oh man and let me just say I didn't believe you wrote that one. <laughs> you just wanted it so bad. I wanted it to be true. Uh, <laughs> I thought the first one was was you all day because it was actually cogent. Um, but That's great. oh, dude, well done. That's all three one. of those. I mean, I, I you're you're getting a good voice with that because I'm like that could that just sounds like what you hear from people in comment sections. So. It's surreal. It's so surreal. Um, so, <laughs> and that's the thing. Now it's like a it's like an arms race. You you got to get better and better and better. You got to yeah, come up yeah, with yeah. new ways. It, oh, oh, I'll go through some that are like bad reviews, but I'm like this this doesn't sound like it was fakely written. So I can't I can't <laughs> I can't use this one. I have to wait until I have to find one that looks like I'm a bad writer pretending to be this person. And that's the one I'm going to use. So. Do, uh, do you? Unfortunately, I'm so sorry to to break your hearts about Royal Tenenbaums. Do you still feel like you can watch the movie and get anything out of it, or have you completely, um, mm. you know, soured to it? I realize now that it's a juvenile, um, manipulative mess of a film that uh, is, you know, very poorly constructed. It has good intentions, but it actually. Um, all the jokes are good in theory, but they don't really land. And now I, I'm kind of embarrassed that I've spent the last, you know, uh, almost 25 years of my life telling people that it's my favorite film. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, honestly, actually, what I did get out of this is that, like, it really is probably it's it's not my favorite Wes Anderson movie, but it's him at his the peak of his powers. I think you guys are totally right that it's uh, straddling both sides of like reality and Wes Anderson land, uh, the best of any of his films. Um, and uh, I just watched it in prep for this, but having done this, I'm probably going to watch it again tonight because it's fabulous, despite uh, whatever that reviewer said. I still like it because Gwyneth Paltrow lesbian scene. Oh, no that's more. true. This, yeah, that's, that's true. Can't, for, can't forget that. That's what? true. Yeah. Insane. Um, so uh, thank you so much for listening. Uh, Austin, where can we find you? Where where, where are you pro want to plug anything? Uh, look up Austin Archer on social media, on YouTube or Instagram or TikTok. And my channel, Your Pal Austin, should come up. Your Pal underscore Austin. You can check out my podcast, which is called People Pleaser with Austin Archer. Or you can go check out my music. Uh if you look up Austin Archer on Spotify or Apple Music or wherever, you know, austinarchermusic.bandcamp.com if you want. My music's all there, too. And, yeah. You are one of the few people who I will actively, like, go to your page, go to your channel, and, and see what you have to say or see what your most recent videos are because I want to see your take. And if you show up on my feed or if your video starts, it is absolutely going to be worth my time. It, and that unequivocally, over and over and over... Um, I get a laugh and I, I learn something and it's phenomenal. You go check them out. Um, I, I feel the same way about your content, Dave. Honestly, oh, I watch every you. every time one one comes up, I stop and I watch. I think the writing and the execution is always so impressive. Thank you so much. Preach, Austin. Preach. Um, yeah. uh, you can find me on DaveColombo.com, DVD Columbo on, on Instagram, Dave Columbo on TikTok. Uh, this has been uh, an. Inc I, I literally want to go back and watch the movie again. This is uh, hundred percent. So I was. I'm fun. dead serious. I'm gonna yeah. go watch it again. It's um, so great. Uh, until next time. Oh yeah. Uh, like, share, subscribe. Please leave us a content, uh, a review. Uh, leave us your own one star review of the movie, uh, and we'll read it out on the show. Um, this has been so much fun. Until next time. This has been uh, goodbye from Dave. Adios. This has been off the mark. <laughs>